In some recent videos I've repaired and then demonstrated this Hitachi KK561 and also this Munro 620 calculator, links down in the description. Both machines date from around 1972. Well now I've got another machine to look at, a Fridden EC1114 which dates from somewhere around 1969. Progress was fast at that time, so going back by three years will make a huge difference in the technology inside. And even without opening the case, the differences are quite apparent. The EC1114 is massive compared to the other two, neither of which are small themselves. Here's a sheet of A4 paper as a size reference. And not only size, but also the weight. The Munro weighs in at just over 2.3 kilograms. The Hitachi is a bit more solid at just over 2.7 kilograms. And the Fridden is a massive 5.6 kilograms. So there's likely to be a lot more stuff going on inside. This machine was made by Hitachi and there was a more or less identical version sold with Hitachi branding called the ELCA24. The calculator has a 14 digit Nixie tube display with a memory function, constant multiplication and division and fixed decimal places from 0 to 9. My example is a little bit battered but nothing too bad. I've no idea yet if it'll work and I'm not going to rush to plug it in until I've checked it thoroughly. The case should have clips at the front edge with two machine screws towards the rear, but at the moment I can simply lift it off because the two front clips have broken off and someone has tried forcing self-tapping screws into the rear threaded brass inserts, snapping one off in the process. Rather handily, all the missing bits were rattling round inside the machine, so I should be able to reattach them in a bit. While we're inside we may as well take a quick look at the exciting bits. As you can tell from all angles, there's a massive amount of soldered wiring loom everywhere you look. Everything is kind of grubby inside, so it needs some careful cleaning. I won't be trying to make it look like a showroom model, but it could do with being a tad cleaner. There's a fairly hefty transformer lurking beneath the keyboard, but the main power supply board appears to be at the back, with the pot for fine-tuning the logic voltage over here. And this is not the original on-off switch. It should be a red push-button switch, so I may try to replace that, if I can find a suitable replacement. What is rather scary is the fact that one of the terminals on the switch is dangerously close to the metal case of the transformer, and the entire keyboard is on rubber mounts, allowing it to move even closer if you lean on it. And lastly, something you won't be able to observe in a video is the smell. It just smells like the late 60s, and I expect that smell will increase if, or when, the machine is running. Ooh, that smells so good. I'm going to start off with the case repair on this machine. Slightly illogical because the rest of the machine might not work, but anyway. I'm pretty sure the case is made of some sort of ABS or similar, so all I need to do is test my plastic weld on an unseen area, such as one of the front lugs. If the plastic is softened, then it'll weld. And indeed it is softened, so we're good to go. It looks like the front lugs were originally bonded or welded in place and they've become detached, so I'll apply enough plastic weld to both surfaces to get them soft. It's taking a bit more solvent than usual. I think the old glue or weld is preventing it from softening as easy as normal. Then once they're ready, I'll quickly press them together. The plastic weld solvent evaporates fairly quickly, so you don't have that much time to work. Anyway, that's about soft enough, so I'll press them together and I'll clamp them to keep the pressure on until it sets. OK, that's all the parts that are found welded back in place and the damaged screw threads cleaned up. I also found a few more of these spacers that sit above the display. There's still one missing, but that might still be inside the calculator if I'm lucky. So on to the exciting bits. As I've come to expect with the Tarchi stuff, this calculator is designed to make it easy to service. With the case off, the keyboard simply lifts off its rubber mounts with enough wire to lay it flat in front of the calculator. 
and sorry about the somewhat cramped shots. There's just too much stuff on my workbench at the moment, and this calculator is pretty big. All the boards look like they have edge connectors, so no struggling with tethered PCBs, as was the case on the Munro I worked on recently. Anyway, I'll dig the power supply out and check that over before deciding what to do next. In order to withdraw the power supply board, the display board has to come out first. So I've cleaned this one up and given it a good look over. There was a 120 ohm resistor that had been getting fairly crispoline over here, so I've replaced that, although it was still working and reading 120 ohms. I also plucked out the two 22 microfarad capacitors beside the resistor. And as on some of the other calculators from this era that I've worked on recently, they were way off their specified value at about 49 microfarads. So I've replaced those as well. I was hoping to keep this calculator fairly original, but I don't want to risk leaving any suspect capacitors. I will, however, bag up any components that I remove in case I want to refit or at least disguise the new replacements in the future. Now onto the power supply board, which is a bit grubby being the top board in the stack. So I'll get that cleaned up and pop out the capacitors to check their values, and I suspect I'll be replacing at least a few of them. As expected, I'm replacing several of the electrolytic capacitors on this board because most of them are way off their specified value. I haven't got a suitable 470 microfarad capacitor in stock for the big one, but that one isn't so far out of tolerance. I'll check the rest of the circuit boards and see if there's any others I need to order. I might also swap these two 10 microfarad caps for more suitable axial leaded ones, but for now these radial ones will have to do. I've had to insulate the legs using some tube because they pass over so many tracks that they could easily short out if unprotected. After that I pulled out the first of the logic boards. There's only one electrolytic capacitor on this board and it's a different make to the rest. Maybe it's been replaced at some time, but it was spot on the correct value, so I'll leave that one for now. I then pulled out the two remaining boards, cleaning them up and giving them a good visual check ready for reinstallation. Maybe someone was a bit tired the day they populated the fourth board, because this chip is pretty badly installed, but it'll still work, so I'll leave it well alone. In case you weren't counting, this calculator has 59 chips inside. Compare that to the Hitachi KK561, which came out about three years after the EC1114 and has a comparable feature set. That machine only has 9 chips, and I'm not counting these 3 switching modules because they're not logic chips. So that's all the boards out and the chassis cleaned up. This board carrier section lifts up to ease the board removal and insertion, although due to the wiring loom it's still a little fiddly getting the bottom one past the transformer here. Each board slides along some runners and is then pressed carefully into the edge connectors at the back. Once installed, there's surprisingly little space between the tops of all those upright resistors and the underside of the board above. I found that I had actually got a suitable 470 microfarad capacitor in stock, so I've replaced that one too. It still seems bizarre how much smaller the modern capacitor is compared to the original one. Again, once I've checked to see whether the machine actually works, I might replace the new radial capacitors with axial ones for a more authentic look. So, now for the big moment. As always, I've got the calculator connected to my power limiting block. This calculator should draw something like 15 watts, and I've only got a 10 watt bulb in the lamp holder at the moment, so I don't expect the calculator to turn on first try, but I prefer to ease up to full power gradually rather than just going for it. So, power on, and as expected the bulb lights up but I'll give it a slightly longer on period, just to make sure no smoke comes out. And that looks fine on the reduced power. So I'll swap the bulb for a 40 watt one, which will still limit the power if something is dead short. And try again. Hmm, well that's a good sign. I'll just move the camera to reduce the reflections a little. And power on again. 
I'll try the usual 1, 2, 3, plus 4, 5, 6, plus 7, 8, 9, plus 9, 8, 7, plus 6, 5, 4, plus 3, 2, 1, which should give us a total of 3, 3, 3, 0. I'm having to go fairly slowly because some of the keys are a little bit sticky at the moment. But there's our correct total. I'll just clear that. Hmm. The clear button doesn't appear to be working, but clear entry is. I'll try a bit of multiplication. So, 7 times 8. And that's also working. Definitely need to sort the clear key out though. I haven't checked the case for any leakage to ground yet, so I'll power off before touching the metal decimal knob. And then I can try a bit of division. So, 355 divided by 113. And that's also good. OK, I've checked everything, and as far as I can see, the only issues are the sluggish keys. That'll just be old grease on the runners for each key the non-functional clear button, and lastly, when I add something into the memory, a light should come on over to the left of the display, so I'll check that while I'm at it. Right, time for a quick update. The non-functional clear key was down to a failed read switch. Usually these things are pretty reliable, but I can hear this one clicking as I move the magnet towards it, yet there's no continuity. If I swap that out for a new one, the replacements we had in stock are a little longer, so I had to put a bit of a dog's leg in the wire to fit it. And this one is working as it should. Anyway, the new read switch is fitted and the clear key is now back working. Similarly, the memory light was just a failed neon lamp. I fitted a replacement and that's working fine. I thought it might have failed due to the neon gas escaping through a poor seal, but if I hold it near to my mini Tesla coil, it still glows, showing the presence of the gas, so it must have been some other issue. This video has gone on a bit longer than planned, so I'll save the demonstration for part 2, which will follow in about a week's time. I'll put a link down in the description when that one goes live. If you've enjoyed watching, please like the video and maybe even subscribe to the channel, not forgetting to click on the bell icon so you get notifications when a new video is released. That's it for now, so thanks for watching and I'll see you in a future video.